Can you hear me? For anyone who's online right now, we will be starting in a few minutes. I'm going to start at about 2.03 to give everyone a chance to sign up. If you are here, please introduce yourself. In the comments, we have the wonderful Lauren, who uh, is the head of the Furious Flowers. Uh, I want to call it department, but it's we're talking a project. It's a beautiful thing. We're going to talk more about it. There will be opportunities to win a copy of each of my books, and one of them, one of the questions I will be asking will be about Furious Flowers. All you have to do is answer correctly. Want to give it one more minute. If you have your water at the moment, you are perfect. If not, run and get it. And I do mean run because we're going to go. Before anyone asks, this is tea. All right. It's only 11 o'clock where I am.
Welcome, everyone. I want to thank you all for attending the Furious Flower Facebook Live reading series. For those of you who don't know, the Furious Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University is the nation's, nation's oldest academic center dedicated to Black poetry. In the 25 years since the first Furious Flowers Conference and the 15 years of the city's brick and mortar existence, Furious Flower programs have reached thousands of poets, educators, students, and poetry lovers around the world. From groundbreaking media and anthologies to summer seminars for educations and decade-defining conferences, Furious Flower has impacted literary communities on local, regional, national, and international levels by creating pro platforms for Black poets to encourage and counter their readers, and for readers to experience and engage with Black literary culture in new and exciting word ways. In addition, this Facebook Live reading series is made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you, NEA. It is a pleasure to be here. All right, how's everyone doing today? Yes, I'm expecting you to actually type that in the chat. I want you all to take a chance to get to know each other because when I start reading, it will be eyes on me. So let me know how you're doing. If you're coming from anywhere outside of California, I want to know. I love to know where people are coming from, who's heard of me, who's looking for money from me. If I owe you money, I'm sorry. And probably not, but it'll be good to hear from you anyway. My name is Indigo Moore. I am the Poet Laureate Emeritus of Sacramento. Uh, my fourth book of poetry just came out, Everybody's Josen for Something. It took second place in the University of Nebraska Press's Backwater Prize. My second book, which I will be taking a look at, I'm going to take a look at my, all of my books here. But my second one, I'm especially proud of, Through the Stone Cutter, Cutter's Window. It won Northwestern University's Press's Cave Conum Prize. It was the first one for that prize for a second book for African Americans. Uh, my first and third books, Taproot and In the Room of Thirst and Hungers, were both part of Main Street Rags editors select poetry series. I am an adjunct professor at Dominican University and visiting faculty for Dominican's MFA program. Uh, there are some of you who are here today who have no idea about this because you only know me as an engineer. I, I'm an integrated circuit layout engineer or a mask designer. I design the insides of computer chips. So I'm a former faculty member at Stone Coast MFA program where I graduated in a, an MFA with an MFA in poetry, fiction, and script writing, and I do all of it. I've had three short plays staged. I've had a full-length stage play that was subsequent, subsequently uh, transplanted, I should say, as a screenplay, and has been optioned as a full-length film. I was in the Navy for 10 years. Some of that will come up in some of the reading, that I'm doing, but mostly I'm a writer. Uh, many people know me as a writer. They know that that's what I do, but there's, they think of me as a poet. They think of me as someone who writes primarily poetry, which I guess you can say that that's been the focus of most of my publications, but it's certainly not the focus of who I've been. And who I've been is what I want to talk about. Uh, about 15 years ago, for the first time, someone referred to me as an elder. I'm 57, so to me, 15 years ago, that was, yeah, I didn't feel like an elder. But I've somewhat gotten used to the idea that the things that I've done can be representative to someone as something to look at, maybe some things not to emulate, that's for damn sure. But I can look at the body of my work and the body of what I've done, not only as a writer, but as an engineer in the Navy. I've got four kids. All of these things mean that I should have gained some knowledge that I can pass down. But we won't go into that. What I will talk about is my writing and how it's progressed over the many years that I've 
dedicated myself to writing. And really it's only since 1999 that I realized that becoming a writer was something that was important to me. The first book that I wrote is entitled Taproot. It came out from Main Street Rag as part, Rag as part of the Editor Select Poetry series. And the best way for me to describe it is to say that I had lost my brother and I was trying to understand and come to grips with how two boys who grew up in the same house could be so disconnected from each other. So I want to read to you the first poem in Taproot. Back through the storm door. I left the South broken, a busted wing and a crooked eye. Still, I wake mornings with the taste of honeysuckle on my tongue. The phone rings, voices weary with traveling, wires weighed down with crows and thick heat. I know it's the South calling me to christen the born or bury the dead. Lord, I'm still addicted to its touch. He doesn't have long. If you're going to come, it better be soon. In bed, hours later, my mind still talent to the phone's bad news. Weed, codeine, scotch. I've ingested enough fog and brain ash to black out the moon, but the crucible of the past is relentless grinding behind eyelids. Memories spark wild along the nerves telegraph. The, the, <clears throat> the lens focuses backwards and the mind grays decades. I dream my past, a fragmented play, spliced together with raw high tides and silk thread. It grows claws and jumps to stage, a beast my hands don't know how to tame. There is no, no balm for the past dull lake. When the blue jay rolls up his song, the whole damn world spins down on me. Falling back through the door, I'm broken again. Most of the poems in this book are very narrative. I grew up in the South and I grew up uh, reading fiction for the most part and I thought like a fiction writer and I struggled to make the transition from fiction writing to poetry. Uh, I took a class with Jane Hirschfield and I took that class for one reason because I knew she was not a narrative poet and I wanted to go to a class that would teach me to write the way that I wanted to write. And for the most part, I just got beat up in that class, but it was great because it's exactly what I needed. I want to read two more poems from this book and then I will move on to my second. The title of the book comes from a study of the blues that I was working on as I was not only trying to figure out how my brother and I have been so estranged, but also trying to understand the growth of an African-American child. So I was reading the blues. I wanted to know more about the South, even though it's a, that's a place where I grew up. And I came across this little bit of information that the great blues singer and musician Muddy Waters grew up in this shack that was on the Mississippi Plains where the river, where the river used to be before they dammed the river. And I thought, is there ever a better understanding of the blues than that statement? Taproot. Concrete and steel drew the Mississippi back like a fist. Scythe blades swung through dry harvests, plows turned soil hard enough to raise the blues. Muddy waters sprang whole, dry heaved from the knotted center of a plankwood shack. He shook himself loose of blood, dirt, moonshine, the ass dark end of a mule, and was gone. Since, twisters have spun the shack round, bent its insides out, till it vomited its secrets on boot dust roads. Now tourists use splintered slivers of history as toothpicks. A little ways down the road, you can squander a week's pay, 
sleep in an old slave shack, spend a day picking cotton, smile for pictures. The Mississippi used to cover these parts until they dammed it up, held its tongue like words you choke back in church to keep your insides from escaping. Staring across dusty fields, you can ache the need for river, almost drown in the longing for waters that won't come here no more. There is a companion poem in a book to the first poem that I wrote, but I'm gonna skip it. The last poem in the book is called Apotheosis. And if you wanna win the free copy of this book, after I finished the poem, someone has described what apotheosis is. There's an extra star in Orion's belt. I arc my mason jar up through the fading light and snatch the firefly in mid pulse. Heat lightning is a distant sweetness. Sugar pink throbs on nimbus clouds draining from the night's basin. A screech owl's cry hugs the pine peaked horizon. Behind me is an aluminum whoosh, a swing, a miss, a curse. In firefly baseball, the elusive lime green flickerings mock us all. Blind in the grain, we are forever doomed to swing where they were. We swear and corkscrew to the ground. The tall, uncut grass plays slivered kite to the evening breeze. Silhouetted, Mama laughs at every exaggerated lunge, twist, and fall. Her fingers are Promethean tongs that trap each cigarette's volcanic ember. But tonight, there is more flame than heart and hand can hold. With the 12 firefly lantern pressed to my cheek, does my face glow, mama? Do I shine? Tomorrow noon, the rusted beak of the weather vane will swing north. Mama, summer, the fireflies, all gone. I'm going to read three poems from Through the Stonecutter's Window, which was the book that won the uh, first Cavie Common Prize for a second book. And I, I like this book, and I was so afraid that no one would understand what I was doing. And I know many of you who are writers go through this. You send out manuscripts and <laughs> you have no idea. You see the book that won and you don't know why it won. You sure yours won. And then you think you understand completely why no one will ever publish you. I believe that there's going to be someone, if you've done the work on your book and you've published it and or you've uh, written it, you've run it past people who understand the process, there will be someone out there or maybe someone out there who will get your book. And that still doesn't guarantee that it's going to get published. There are a lot of writers out there. If you just look in the chat, you can see how many writers there are out there. And especially when a book represents something that you wonder if someone's going to get. I was writing a book that basically looked at the world from the vantage point of a black hole staring out a stonecutter's window. The stonecutter was really the person that I was looking at, someone who didn't understand exactly what was going on in the world, but was gleaning everything and choosing not to have all these preconceptions about what he was looking at. But I also wanted something, someone to be speaking that didn't understand the stonecutter. So the, the poems aren't from the viewpoints of the stonecutter or the black hole, but it's from the viewpoint of someone who feels that they have so much to learn about the world. And that person, of course, was me. The first poem I'd like to read for, for, me, for you is an ekphrastic piece. And if you want a free copy, after the poem is over, you have to put down what an ekphrastic poem is. 
Actually, I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to give you another question. I just realized I need to tell you to explain this poem. Uh, it's entitled Veiled Vision, and it's a poem about artwork uh, by, from an audio, this one by an artist by the name of Katie Kalk. And I'm a huge Monet fan, and I went down to see what I thought was going to be a Monet that I was going to be writing a poem about, but it turned out to be a artwork or a picture of Monet that she had painted. And I loved the picture because it was showing Monet as you don't get to see him very often, uh, not bigger than life, but older and in a basically a rocking chair. Veiled Vision, Acrylic by Katie Kalk. Anchored as his tired bones insisted to the chair, sunken into a cashmere coat with thick raised collar. You had no choice but to swirl his weight onto the wicker armrest. You give us Monet, subtracted by everything he no longer is. Cataracts stacking behind shades, shrunken skull plastered beneath the brim of a gaudy sun hat. No wonder he succumbed to this pose. Camille, Alice and John are all dead fading as his days in his eyesight. Gently he rocks, the cottage before him, the bridge after off the focus of the canvas. I can almost see you pyrrhically calling brilliant strokes and heroic light to take arms against the dying of Claude seasons. Yet, not even your signature, resembling a Roman numeral nine, can resurrect feline litheness into his body. Of the futility he must sense in you, the bemused tilt of his head says all we need to know. Beneath the light-soaked beard, our lips pressed to keep the secret you are desperate to protect us, to protect us from. A day will come for each of us when we are nothing more than still life in someone else's eyes. This was the first ekphrastic poem that I'd ever tried. And I came about it after reading a poem by Carl Phillips entitled Passion. And in it, he was extrapolating so much. He was writing about this picture of a woman, yet he chose to say, okay, this isn't only about the picture, it's about the painter, it's about my relationship to the, to the painting and how I perceive everything. And to me, I believe the perfect ekphrastic poems always start from that point, where you're not just trying to describe the picture, you're just trying to describe everything that encompasses you experiencing this picture. And in that vein, uh, Aaron Douglas wrote, uh, not wrote, but he was a painter, painted an incredible series of pictures called Aspect of Negro Life. And the entire second chapter of this book, which is six somewhat long poems, is dedic are dedicated to that one painting. And in my understanding of it, you see an African-American man leaving the South, leaving a farm, going to join the Harlem Renaissance, being irrevocably changed by what happens, not necessarily for the better, and then attempting to return to the South. I'm only going to read the, the part called The Homecoming, where you see his return reflected through his eyes, his brother's eyes, and then his father's. The Homecoming, Prodigal. I dream of sweet grass and grunting tractors, how the South can linger unscratchable. Mama still dreams an oak anchors my spine. She can't see there's rot hollowing the flesh. Memories clutch too tight, twist a kudzu and crabgrass. Creek water stills, turn stagnant. It's mama's fault I've come home. Not seeing the horror I've become, she'll let me in. Brother, you come home scratching track scars, jagged symbols. Even a blind man can trace your history. 
I hear the limehouse refuses more of the ghosts you carry. So you store them bundled up with box twine, a dry tender to spark the grief you spread. Looks like you still slave to the hate of us. This farm, scorched and cratered, remembers you. I prophesize your return from shadows on the fields, curses darkening the sky. Father, my son, I wish your back unbroken from the weight in your eyes, body a question mark of sorrows, hostage to past laments. I wish black sheep could be free of mythos. I wish your fingers clean of tangled knots, the one heirloom you didn't steal from me. I forgive the moon for lighting your path. I forgive the good Lord for not troubling your compass. I forgive the train's whistle for trumpeting you back. I even forgive the street signs for pointing you home. I'm going to move on. I will definitely be conscious of time. To end the room of thirst and hungers, which was without a doubt my most ambitious uh, understanding of myself or attempt to understand myself and as a poetic concept, I had this idea that Paul Robeson and Othello were cousins and I wanted them to speak to each other. And as they spoke to each other, Paul Robeson had traveled farther down his road, excuse me, Othello had traveled farther down his road that Paul Robeson had. And I wanted them to talk, not just through themselves, but through the people in their lives about the times they were in, about the persecution of African-Americans and of Moors, about misogyny, about everything that went around what they were doing and decidedly change their lives, sometimes for the good and at the end for the worse. It took about eight years to do all the research for it. And what I got for that, those eight years is this. I learned a lot about writing to history and culture and mainly that what you needed to, what you need to write about has nothing to do with the history of the individuals. The first time I wrote this book and got about three quarters of the way through, all I had was a history book. And what I needed to do was go back to each individual that I was writing about and find that moment in their life that seemed to resonate through everything that they were doing. It took forever and it was well worth it. The first poem I wanna read is called A Bullfight, A Revolution and a Langston. Uh, Langston Hughes and uh, Ernest Hemingway were friends in Spain. They were both uh, correspondents to American newspapers. They were both writing about the uh, writing about the Spanish Civil War, and it's known that they were friends. And since they both loved bullfights, uh, it's assumed that they went to bullfights together, and they must have because I wrote a poem about it. A bullfight, a revolution, and a Langston. Fondling a gin flask, Hemingway quips, we should live in the ring, not die on our butts in the stands. The matador executes Veronica, wiping the brow of a two-ton Christ. Today, there are no nationalists, no loyalists, only Spaniards. Ernest believes the Negro will have his day, that all locked doors shatter their frames when kicked open. Three barbed flags dive like swimmers into the bull. All poetry should be that direct, merciless to marrow. Tertia de Muerte, the beast sways a cattail in a zephyr. I wonder if he can taste his ancestor's screams in the air. We could hollow his horns and trumpet two civil wars, America to Spain, 
his sacrifice uniting our struggles. There's a devil in the matador's patience, sword and maletta, the cape, red not for the bull, but to hide the blood. Every revolution needs a martyr. Mules pull the carcass round the ring like Hector's at Troy. Ernest says muleta and mulatto were meant to sound alike, that both carry a man's hard choices locked in skin. I'm going to read one more poem from this book because I do want to get to everyone's jo everybody's Jones in for something. Freeze Frame was written for the wonderful saxophonist Jimmy Lunsford. It's so easy to look at the main characters of a particular time frame and not realize or remember that they were integrated into that time frame. His life uh, coincided with uh, W.B. Du Bois's, and we know this because W.B. W. B. Du Bois did not want Jimmy Lunsford, who was in love with Nina Du Bois, W.B.'s daughter, to marry Jimmy, and she was in love with him. Eventually, her, her husband was chosen for her by her father. Uh, many of you will know who that is, County Cullen, who was very gay, but Du Bois got the marriage of the century, which is what he wanted. Uh, the poem originated for me just seeing a picture of Jimmy Lunsford on stage and the caption being, he dies 24 hours later. How can you not write about that, especially after you've done enough research to put it into context? Freeze frame. In 48 hours, he'll headline a slab in the moor. But tonight, Jimmy's band is hot. The highs high, the lows scrape dust off the McElroy ballroom floor. On this man, 45 looks 60. Still, he fans his sax and the room blurs silent. It's true. When you heard about the divorce, when Nina Du Bois discovered what all Harlem already knew, County Cullen packed more sugar in his heels than a Louisiana cane field. Jimmy laughed his ass off. But that was years ago. Tonight, not good enough for Daddy Du Bois, has no place on this stage cause Jimmy's band is hot. He stumbles. Gravity troubles his wingtips, spotlight to spotlight. Ankles swollen, stuffed deep in fine thread socks. He's no bird, never been. A couple notes spew flat, wander the crowd begging for change. It's clear he's gut shot, his sheet music pinned on silk lining a pine box. Clamped to his leg, a coronary house, you can die here or seaside, Jimmy. He'll flash cool in the tux, even dead, a cemetery May not be the cotton club, but hey, a gig's a gig, and hot is hot. And let me tell you, Jimmy's band. All right, we're doing well. I'm going to finish with everybody's jonesing for something. It just came out March 1st on uh, University of Nebraska's press. Uh, it's the Backwaters Prize. I took second place behind a wonderful... Uh, Jennifer K. Sweeney will be reading together June 7th. Uh, I write fiction, I write poetry, I write stage, uh, I write essays, and this was a press and a prize who took all of that, because that's what the manuscript was, and published it. It is a book about our times, it's a book about Everyone is Jones and for something. We all have this idea that what we want, what we need, what we desire is the way that the world should be. I'm no different from anyone else. What I want is understanding of things that trouble me. The first poem is entitled A Love Letter to Dr. Ford from the Patriarchy. I believe that what happened to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Christine Ford 
was a travesty. And I wonder how you can look a woman in the face after laughing at her pain and then say, hey, but how can you not be with us? So I decided to see how that happens. Dear Christine, what has happened to our women? I won't drag reason into your delusion, swatting at windmills with a broom. You complain, even as a thousand cameras section you like a hog. In the 50s, we would have doused your furnace with Valium. My mother could watch hummingbirds for hours, the inside of her skull, Rorschach flashcards. But the pot roast was never late. Honey, I'm fighting for this country, cracking eagle eggs into frying pans to make us great again. Rebranding swastikas, painting the arms red striped and blue eyed. Hell, I'll reach my hand up Lady Liberty's skirt and goose to flame if I have to. Sluice purple mountains, pan the American dream from streams crimson with Native American tears. And this is how you thank the architects of paradise. Be reasonable. Drag the viper from the cigar box. Patriotism is a horse losing your name in a bet. Open this gift box. Here's a charred chunk of greenwood, some faded California camp pictures. Remember how we tossed peanuts to Japanese in cages until laughter caused stitches in our kidneys? Slow your heart. Guzzle this Librium martini. Let's fold the top down, ride through the, suns <clears throat> through the sunset like Roy and Dale. We'll pitch tents in the Alamo, my guitar strung with real Mexican guts. I'm building two McDonald's for every crack in the wall. Christ, woman, have you ever felt safer? Take this Prozac lemon drop and voting sheets already filled out for you. When we christen my, christen my yacht, we'll save money on fireworks, shoot immigrants from cannons on the 4th. Finish the dishes, woman. We'll have sex on the foreclosure papers that turn Harlem into a street mall. It won't be like college sex, but is it ever? Hush, Chrissy. Maybe you were assaulted, but bet dollars to donuts, you enjoyed it. All right, I'm near the end. I'm going to read one uh, short prose piece and then a poem I'd like to dedicate to Furious Flowers. Guardians. Grandpa Daniel was in his late seventies, yet still spry enough to climb the tree in our backyard for figs. He insisted that the only man ever worth dying for was Martin Luther King Jr. I'd take a bullet for that man. Yes, I would, he said, raining figs down upon his grandson, Michael, who raced around the tree beneath his grandpa's scrawny legs. Michael balanced a large wicker basket on his head, always a foot away from where the figs hit the ground. When they shot the Reverend King, Grandpa Daniel was true to his word. He lay down on his bed, deciding this was the bullet meant for him. Soon, he told his granddaughter-in-law, Caroline, the good reverend will wake up and I will be a hero. But days later, Grandpa Daniel was still alive and the reverend was still very much dead. No less true to his word than he was before the announcement of the funeral, Grandpa decided that God hadn't switched him and the Reverend because Grandpa hadn't proven how serious he was. So, Daniel, who had survived seven sit-ins, six police dog attacks, and four hosing downs with water he claimed was colder than Alaskan ice, dug a shallow grave in the backyard. He donned his second best dress suit, his best, he reasoned, he would wear at his funeral, and lay down in the grave. That night, it rained. 
Caroline, who had promised her late husband that she would look after his dad, put an umbrella over the head of the ditch. From his bedroom window, Michael could see his grandfather's feet sticking out from under his gray half dome of a promise, his wool pants sticking to his legs. On the day of the funeral, Caroline turned the volume of the old zenith up loud enough to shake the windows. Really, she was turning it up loud enough to wake the not dead. After a few minutes, the screen door creaked open and Grandpa shuffled in. His back was caked with mud, but Caroline didn't complain when he sat down on the couch between her and Michael. When they showed a close-up of King's face, still as dead as Grandpa was not, Daniel took first Michael's hand and then Caroline's. He was crying. I'm sorry, he said. I'm sorry I did everything I could. But he wasn't talking to his grandson or his daughter-in-law. He was looking at the TV. He was apologizing to everyone in the glass. I want to thank you all for showing up. I want to end with a poem, as I said, for Furious for Flowers. And it's dedicated to anyone in the struggle, how we got here from there. I cross swam a river, snake pit, coolness pounded into my temple. A requiem of angels took pity dipped one wing, dusted off my knees, blessed my skin. Barefoot, I haunted back roads, shouldering your memory, sober-eyed and mysterious. Howled a pregnant moon down from a willow tree, cracked bone lust and sucked marrow, hexed my guilted shadow, somersaulted naked through poppy fields, licked dew off the back of headstones. For six months, I dodged poison darts, took a sledge to the chest, collapsed, caught your scent on the breeze, rose like Christ, a punch drunk flag bearer, airs genuine and swollen. Enabled by your name, I stumbled over fireflies, sharpened my canines, yanked myself forward, brushed off my heart, put it back in my chest set my head skyward, looking for any sign, your face in the clouds. Thank you very much. We still have time that we're gonna open the floor to questions. I have a little more that I want to say at the end and I will have questions that will enable you to win one of each of the books. So the wonderful Lauren who runs this beautiful, beautiful project, and I'm going to continue to say project because when you start saying it's an institution or something, it feels complete to me. And from what I've seen from Furious Flowers and what she is doing with it, complete is the last thing it will ever be. It will just evolve. It will grow. It will continue to be something wonderful. Assistant director, that's what she is. Okay. And no, I'm not falling asleep. I'm looking at the chat to see if I can see what's going on. One of the sad things about getting older is everything gets smaller at the same time, because I'm sure it's not me. Yes, I know this. Joan Gabin is founder and director of Furious Flowers. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. I'm loving this because I'm seeing a lot of praise in the chat and nobody's got questions. Let's see who's going to be the first person that breaks that. All right, so I talk about poetic progression. Someone sent it, sent it directly to me. 
Yes, I talk about poetic progression, and I wanted to speak about that. Uh, people ask me, and not people, usually students, ask me about um, about how my, my, all my books are different. I don't want to be a poet who writes the same book, but I can't say that that was something that I set out to do. But if I, as I've changed and I read poets all the time and I see different things they're doing and I pay attention to what's going on in my life, my writing changes. And as my writing changes, it encourages me to try different things. I'm fortunate uh, that I don't rely on my poetry for a uh, living. Because I'd live, but who knows, I'd probably be in a cardboard box. But I'd still be alive because I continue to change and continue to challenge myself. And I want to be exactly, yeah, exactly who I am at the time. Oh, how did I hear about Furious Flowers? Um, <laughs> Tony Wynn, and it's interesting that, you know, I know Tony Wynn well, and it's interesting that this is something that really sticks out in my mind, that she introduced me to Furious Flowers. This was many years ago, at least a decade, and she asked me if I'd heard of them, and I hadn't. I hadn't even heard of the poem. Oh, I'm giving away the answer to a question. I haven't even heard, I hadn't even heard the poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, where the uh, idea of Furious Flowers came from. And yeah, I think the more I learned about it, the more I've always wanted to be a part of it, to be asked to read, to be here. So right now you are actually experiencing something that I've longed for for a long time to somehow, some way be a part of Furious Flowers. And before, uh, before this, uh, they put out an anthology recently, and I'm in that also. I was very happy about it. Am I working on a new book? Uh, yes, but it's it's a memoir. And one, we we'll keep talking about writing in different genres. Uh, I've been working on a memoir and I've been doing a little more work on it. And I love, loved where it was going until I came up with this idea for a screenplay that kind of supersedes the memoir. And I'm now struggling over which one I'm going to do. Uh, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but movies tend to make a lot more money than memoir. So I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a consideration as I go forward. But uh, yeah, and we'll see how it goes. Absence of a Whole is the title of it, and we'll see if I get to finish it. Oh, so uh, someone wants to know what I said about writing about people in history, how you need to find the essence of the person you are writing about. Um, when you, it's when you're writing about someone that you're researching, you have so much information that can come from a history book or something that someone taught you, but you have to remember you're communicating an emotion in poetry. So find one moment in their life that really speaks to you and then everything else will come from that. When I'm writing about uh, the poem that I read about Langston Hughes and Ernest Hemingway, I'm really writing about the Spanish Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, which was going on in America. But what better place to write about it than with the two of these men sitting, watching a bull trying to survive. So even though it was about all those things, it came down to these two men sitting in a bullfight. And the same thing with uh, the poem about Jimmy Lunsford. Uh, it was him on stage. He's playing his butt off. And yet the caption below, it said he'd be dead in 24 hours. It was actually 48 hours. But how could I not think, what is he thinking at this moment? He was probably just thinking about playing. But so much has happened to this man. He's been told that he is not good enough for W.B. Du Bois's daughter. That had to stick with him. Do the research, and when you find the moment you want to write about, everything else will come into play. But if you haven't done the research, nothing will come into play. Talk about what his writing has made him unearth about his brother that he didn't realize. 
Wow. I, I teach a class called Writing to History and Culture. And I think, well, I know. Um, I, have, I do these uh, meditative exercises and I have people close their eyes because when you're writing about something that you already know how it ends, you want to rush to the end. You know how it ends and you want people to understand how it ends. You want to rush to the end of that tunnel, tunnel but you forget you have to make them uh, imagistic uh, participants in whatever you went through. So you have to remember the smells, the tastes, everything. But the last thing I do in that exercise is they have to go through the other person's eyes. What does that person see? Have you even thought about what that person was going through? You know what you think that person was going through, but think a little deeply about what was going on in their lives. Everyone is the hero of their own story. And when you're writing about history and culture, sometimes the best viewpoint of a story is not yours. It's someone else's. Um, I discovered my brother was afraid. He had no choice to be considering all the things he was going through. He was in a world and in a time frame that would never recognize who he was. And I had to remember that, that the bravado I saw in him, the, the sometimes violence I saw in him, was him trying to make a way through a place that didn't accept it. And it made it much easier to write about him. My writing process. My writing process is something you should never emulate. Um, I sit down, I have an image in my mind. Most of what I write usually comes from an image. Uh, Nikki Finney once told me, because I never keep revisions of poems, she told me, how can you ever write a poem if you ever, if you throw away all the revisions? I want to see the revision exactly the way I think about it. The minute I think these two lines should be here, I want to put them there. I don't keep revisions because I know that even if I lose something or something doesn't turn out the way that it was, that I thought it might, I don't have to go back. Something else will come. Uh, Michael Harper, not Michael Harper. Oh, I wish it had been Michael Harper. I've known to love him. There was another... Uh, another poet who took me through meditative exercises and he was thinking talking about uh just writing from the subconscious and that's kind of how i write i start writing i'm not rushing to write anything down if i have an idea i most of the time don't write it down if it stays with me it was meant to be written and if, it, if i lose it something else will come there's something very liberating about telling yourself you're a writer and understanding that you will always have ideas. And the one that you forgot was not going to win you a Pulitzer. It'll be the next one or the next one after that. You'll always have ideas. Don't let that panic rule how you're writing. Remember how you were when a kid when you realize you're trying to fit one sentence on the page, but you're getting near the end. So you start writing faster and smaller. Don't do it. Go to the next line. There will always be a next line. All right. How does each form manifest differently? Writing in fiction screen. You know, there's that's a very good question. And uh, I teach a class uh, that talks about transitioning from poetry and fiction to stage and screen. And there's a longer class that talks about the difference between each one. I was uh, at AWP one year and I was at the bar, you know, just drinking tea, I'm sure. And uh, talking to this woman who was telling me that she didn't like it when poets tried to write fiction or fiction writers tried to write poetry because she could always tell. Now I wasn't questioning her because I was young to writing at that time, but I asked her, you know, about several writers who wrote poetry and she didn't even know that they wrote poetry, which gave me the impression that she probably didn't read much poetry. So I wondered, how is it that people make this change in their minds to write from one form to another? 
And when I went to my MFA program, the Stone Coast MFA program, um, that's what I went in to do. I wanted to learn to write across multiple genres. They, they are very different. And the easiest way to explain it is to say, you're probably a poet. If you're a poet, you spent years studying how the genres are different. And you got to do the same for the next genre. It will take as much work, but it will be quicker because you now you'll know what you're looking for, the things that actually make it different from something else. Uh, look at books, look at scripts. You got to read scripts. You got to read fiction. You have to train your mind to think differently. At this point, in complete hubris, I can say that once I'm starting to write in uh, another genre, I've switched over to thinking that way. But I only think that because I spent a lot of time having to force myself to rethink it as I wrote one genre to another. How does your non-writing science life impact your writing life and vice versa? It's vice versa. I believe that neither one of those things inform each other. What I do believe is that I am a person who informs both of them. I'm very meticulous. I, I don't agonize over words, but I'm looking for the right ones. I'm looking for the ones that make sense for that. And it's the same thing uh, in engineering. What I do, there has to be some level of autism in me. Because it's like, imagine looking at a Jackson Pollock and saying, okay, I, I see how this is supposed to go. And then you have to start taking each line and putting them in an order to make sense. That's kind of what I do in engineering, but it doesn't bother me. But it's the same thing in poetry. I'm doing the same thing as I'm writing. I'm a person who is built for that meticulous work. How to untie your fingers to start writing. Read other people's work, and the minute you see a line or a word that speaks to you, write it down and riff off of it. See where it gets you. The first poem that I read, um, the first poem I read in my second book, uh, Through the Stonecutter's Window, was an ekphrastic piece about Monet. And to me, that poem is a copy of the, of the uh, Cyrus Cassell's poem that I talked about. So much so, no, it was Carl Phillips. Yes. And so much so that when I saw Carl Phillips, I almost apologized. I said, look, dude, I think I copied one of your poems and made it my own. And he looked at it because I dedicated the poem to him in the book and said, I've never written anything like that in my life. You can try to copy somebody. You'll never write like them. You'll still be writing yourself. Describe my writing process. Oh my God, I missed a lot of a lot of things. All right, which comes first, the form or the idea? The idea. My uh, my third book was written in a form that I invented, and even then, even though I knew the form, the ideas always came first. Um. All right. Oh, good, cause we're closing in, and I have something I want to say. Okay, some people are just making fun of me. I love this, but I'm not going to respond to it. Ha! It's my time. All right, if you have any more questions that you need to reach me, it's indigomore at gmail.com. Uh, this has been wonderful. As I told you, because I, when I was writing many of you, I told you this is important to me. It is. I want to thank you for tuning in to Fewer's Flowers Facebook, Facebook Live Reading Series. The reading series will continue through mid-June, so mark your calendars. Uh, next week, which is May 14th, Keisha Gay Anderson, May 28th, uh, Tonga uh, Martin. I'm not even going to try to do the middle name. It looks like Eason, Eisen, E-I-S-E-N. June 4th, Nando, uh, Nando Comer. June 11th, Terry Ellen Cross Davis. Love Terry Ellen Cross Davis. Uh, thank you again to the National Endowment for the Arts for supporting this series. And for information on this and other programs, 
follow Fleurs Flowers on social media or visit their website at www.jmu, this is James Madison University, edu slash Furious Flower. Thank you and stay safe.